At Wildlife Conservation Network, we believe there is hope for even the most threatened species. And we know it will take a community working together to make that hope a reality. That's why we invest in local leadership and conservation around the world. Support a network of partners with bold, effective solutions and establish wildlife funds to save a threatened species across its entire habitat. We connect donors with the conservation work they support and ensure 100% of their money goes to the work they care about. Together, we are building a world where people and wildlife can coexist and thrive. WCN is perhaps the most extraordinary and successful conservation organization anywhere. Join us in creating a future for wildlife. Hello and welcome to the WCN Wildlife Conservation Expo. I'm Paul Thompson in San Francisco and I'll be your host tonight. So if you've been joining us all week, welcome back. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We're really glad you're here. So at the WCN Expo, we find inspiring conservationists from around the world working to protect wildlife and we bring them directly to you. In today's show, our theme is Life Aquatic, and we'll be visiting Belize, Panama, Cameroon, and Tanzania to meet some of our conservation partners who are working at the front lines to protect marine mammals, other wildlife, and their habitats. So following each session, we're going to have a live Q&A right here where we're going to answer your questions. So make sure if you have a question, please drop it in the chat to the right of the screen. So let's dive in. First up, we have the Mar Alliance. Welcome to WCN's Fall Expo. I'm Rachel Graham, founder of the marine nonprofit Mar Alliance. My team and I welcome you to this wonderful gathering where we connect you with the oceans to highlight our mission to explore, enable, and inspire conservation action for threatened marine wildlife with coastal communities. Essentially, our goal is to rewild our tropical seas with ocean giants. And as the pandemic recedes, we have seen hope for increases in marine wildlife in several locations. We've trained many new partners and we've witnessed shifts in fisher and consumer attitudes and engagement that bode so well for the future of threatened fish. For more on our work, I pass the baton over to our Belize National Coordinator, Jamal Andrin Bone. Hi everyone, my name is Jamal Andrin Bone and I am the National Coordinator for Mar Alliance in Belize. In our country, Mar Alliance has the distinction of having the longest running or sustained monitoring of marine megafauna in the region, coming up to 15 years. And what that has enabled us to do is to have these unique insights into their life history, their abundance, their movement patterns in our area, to the benefit not only of scientists and fishers that we work with, but the communities that these fishers come from that depend on these species for their life and livelihood. Our almost 15 years of monitoring, much like every, many other NGOs around the world, were impacted by the COVID pandemic. And so after a brief hiatus, we were happy to be able to jump back into the water again last year in 2021. And again, of course, this year with some exciting outcomes and findings coming out of this. But I'll see you no more on this front. I will hand over to our research officer, Clara Sabal, to tell you a little bit more about what we've seen. Hi, my name is Clara Sabal, the research officer here with Mara Lance. Coming on board with Mara Lance in 2021 has been a very exciting and rewarding experience. From working directly with fishers to partnering with marine protected area managers who are eager to continue monitoring here in Belize. After my first full year of monitoring in 2021 and 2022 and speaking to fisher partners and other scientists, we've noticed that shark abundance has increased. And in fact, when you compare data from 2021 and 2022 with previous data, shark abundance has actually doubled at Lighthouse and Turnip Atoll. As a Belizean, this data gives me a sense of hope that we might one day be able to rewild our waters and see a more diverse marine ecosystem that not only benefits our marine species, but also those whose livelihoods depend on it. Muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es Ivan Emanuel Torres. Vivo en la aldea de Sardegna, soy pescador y actualmente trabajo para Mar Alliance. Como pescador, he tenido un poco de experiencia desde muy pequeño, entre los 10 años a los 11 años cuando empecé a salir al mar. Y eh, de ahí con mi padre aprendí un poco de cómo manipular 
específicamente las tortugas, porque son un poquito más dóciles y tiburones, pues solo nomás eh, los he manejado en captura de redes y de ahí hasta hoy día que tengo la experiencia con Mara Lions, que es muy diferente. Fue una gran experiencia eh, tener esa captura ahí en eh, Cayo Luna con todos mis compañeros. Eh, básicamente fui yo el único que se tiró al, al agua, pero entre todo el grupo hicimos posible la captura porque igual si no trabajas como un grupo creo que nada sale bien, pero el que se aventó y en los que me apoyaron fui yo. Y fue una gran experiencia atrapar esa cosa. Actualmente la importancia para mí trabajar con My Alliance es eh, proteger realmente los tiburones porque en un futuro el tiburón puede ser beneficioso para todo el pescador o para todo el país que trabaje tal vez con turismo. Porque los tiburones, tanto como las tortugas, son importantes para el ecosistema marítimo y tal vez en un futuro igual nos ayuden a alimentarlos, no con su carne, sino económicamente. So you've now heard from several of our team members about the highlights and excitement of our monitoring now that we've been able to get back into the water. What is even more rewarding and exciting for us is when our findings are able to influence policy changes on behalf of the species that we advocate for. The most recent example was in 2021 when, after multiple recommendations from our alliance uh, as part of National Short Working Group, we were able to see the government of Belize signing legislation to ban shark fishing within two miles of the three atolls in Belize. Another great example of how sustained monitoring and consultations can influence policy is the 2020 national ban on the use of gillnets in maritime waters in Belize, which was as a result of many years of sustained opposition and, and demands from not only conservationists but also fishers and and connected communities, as well as the tourism sector, to ensure that the variety of species that are impacted by gillnets were given, finally given a break to breathe and to recover their populations. This is what we hope will happen as a result of the ban that over, over time these commercially important species for consumption as well as tourism are able to rejuvenate, to rebound and repopulate Belize's waters once again. Here now to introduce a new channel that we've been able to undertake to influence policy is our technical coordinator, Ivy Barmore, who will be talking about the non-detriment finding exercise that Belize recently undertook with contribution and input from Mar Alliance. Many countries with shark fisheries export their shark products, such as meat and fins. These exporting countries are required to abide by international laws that regulate the trade of threatened species. CITES is a multilateral treaty designed to protect endangered plants and animals and is essentially a licensing system for countries that export products from listed species. To prove that they can export them sustainably, parties or countries must complete what is known as a non-detriment finding, or NDF, for listed species. Completing an NDF is just about as exciting as it sounds, but essentially helps CITES parties pull together all of the information on the species and the threats to determine if the export of the species uh, falls within CITES rules. And until recently, it was entirely on paper. Recognizing that the cumbersome process was a barrier to many nations completing an NDF, we worked with the German government to modernize the process by creating an automated digital template. This was converted to a user-friendly online tool and thus the eNDF was born. Belize conducted its first NDF for hammerhead and silky sharks a couple of months ago, and we were excited to help release our baby into the wild and co-lead the ENDF process. By undertaking the procedure, Belize is setting itself up to further ensure the sustainability and rewilding of sharks in its waters. The work Marlands conducts in Belize has far-reaching implications, not just for the populations that are within our national waters, but throughout the Mesoamerican Reef, as many of the species that we study are highly migratory we have been able to connect into a network of collaborators and allies to understand these animals throughout the reef and also in the broader region. I now hand the baton over to Dr. Rachel Graham, our executive director, to tell you more about what's happening on the ground and in the sea in Panama. Thank you, Jamal. Well, we've applied our successful approaches developed in Belize and the Mesoamerican Reef in the Western Caribbean to Panama's Atlantic and Pacific coasts. Our work spans a range of community-based marine wildlife monitoring and fisheries assessments that generate essential data for management and underpin our conservation action. And our initiatives also create jobs, youth education and empowerment, 
and catalyze marine friendly policies. To speak more about our approach in Panama is Malena Sarlo, our national coordinator. Hi, my name is Malena Sarlo and I'm the National Coordinator for Mar Alliance in Panama. We work in Coiba National Park off the southwest coast of Panama in the Pacific Ocean. Coiba is a UNESCO site for its outstanding universal value. It provides key ecological link to the Eastern Tropical Pacific Marine Corridor. It is uh, the last refuge for a number of threatened animals and um, an essential area for migratory species, a valuable habitat for cetaceans, sharks, sea turtles, and a, and a large variety of pelagic fish, species of high importance to local and regional level fisheries. Mar Alliance completed the first megafauna assessment in and around the park with local members of the communities surrounding the protected area. We are now shifting our attention to assessing small scale fisheries. The community of Palo Seco is a great example of how we are working with communities around Coiba National Park. Gracias WCN y todos los que nos sintonizan hoy. Mi nombre es Jocelyn Ayrin Alvarado, Panamá, provincia de Veragua. Trabajo en el proyecto de monitoreo de desembarque pesquero en la comunidad de Palo Seco. Este proyecto es importante porque nos enseña a identificar diversas especies y tomar su medida total y saber si esa especie llegó a su nivel de madurez el arte de pesca con el que fue capturado y el lugar. Para mí, en lo personal, este proyecto ha sido muy emocionante, ha sido divertido y me ha encantado eh, conocer muchas cosas que hay en nuestros océanos, pero también me ha sorprendido saber que muchas de esas especies están en peligro de extinción. Y ojalá proyectos como este puedan ser llevados a muchos lugares para que así podamos hacer todos juntos algo por estas especies que nos necesitan el día de hoy. In Mar Alliance, we work with local communities to promote small-scale fisheries management. To secure a future for marine wildlife, we need ocean stewards from all backgrounds. We train community leaders, youth, women, and interested people in monitoring fisheries landings, and then we replicate to other communities through peer exchanges. We are trying to improve our collective understanding of what is fished to advance local management of fisheries and reduce impacts to threatened species such as hammerheads. We are currently helping communities get ready for the expected rapid race of tourism in certain areas that are key to biodiversity. Tourism can be a great opportunity for communities to prosper, but at the same time can represent a threat to local livelihoods and the, and the environment if not managed properly. Understanding the drivers of fishing and marine resource use is key to designing and identifying management and conservation strategies. And with this, I pass the baton to Rachel. Thank you, Malena. Compassionate and lasting conservation of marine wildlife and coastal communities truly requires a multiplicity of approaches to reach a triple win for wildlife, sustainable resource use, and people. Although it takes a range of approaches to rewild our seas, it mostly takes building of relationships, trust, and hard work over many years. We have our work cut out for us, especially with the rising impacts and uncertainties brought by climate change. But it is with your help, from small to large, that we are able to meet the growing demands for marine conservation in the coming decades. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our heart for all the support you have given us. And if you are not part of our Alliance for Marine Wildlife, then do join us on this incredible journey to rewild our seas. And now I'm being joined by Rachel Graham, Executive Director of Mar Alliance, and Jamal Andrew and Vaughn, who's the Belize National Coordinator. Welcome to WCN Expo, guys. Thanks for being here. Hi, Paul. Lovely to be here. Thanks for having us. So it's, it's, it's so impressive the amount of work you are doing in Central America. Rachel, I want to start by asking you what inspired you to found Mar Alliance? Um, well, I founded Mar Alliance in 2014, and really what inspired me was the ability to create uh, an NGO, a nonprofit that could respond really quickly to needs at the front lines for conservation of marine wildlife, and one that can pivot very quickly 
to integrate innovative technologies to also meet community needs and so much more. And, um, and that's what we've done. And that's exactly what we're running with Marlines. And Jamal, how long have you been with the organization and what sort of got you passionate about conservation? I, so I've been with Marlines since October of 2019. So we just literally made three years. We're doing the, the very short math earlier today. So three years. And um, my, my interest or my drive for joining Marlines was truly the commitment, not only to the wildlife, but the people that depend on them and working alongside, and in this case, obviously it's the fishers, working alongside them to safeguard these species and ensuring that they were actually um, key players in it, not just, not just taking a, um, having them in the, the, in the audience, so to speak, or, or telling them what is going on, giving them an opportunity to be part of the effort to safeguard these species and ensuring that their, their um, insights were valued and part of that effort. Hmm. Rachel, you said uh, that we need to rewild our tropical seas with ocean giants. And that's a line that I just love so much. Uh, why do our oceans need giants? So, well, there's a couple of things. First of all, over the last 50 years, we've seen a 90% drop in the abundance of large fish, large animals in the sea, but especially large fish. And they actually occupy key and critical ecosystem roles in the sea. They keep the sea very healthy by regulating other prey species. Also, they're very important for food security and, and fisheries. Um, and of course, they inspire and draw awe for so many people and, and a very big component of a growing and extremely lucrative marine tourism industry. So we really need to bring these species back uh, first and foremost, so that we actually have healthy seas, we have stronger food security, and because we're, we're, we're absolute realists, we would love to have many of these ocean giants, the turtles, the hammerheads, you know, the, the big snappers and groupers, and, uh, but we also recognize that fisheries are a very important component to keeping many coastal communities, many countries healthy, so we want to bring them back. And we want to do it in collaboration with communities and other dependent stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of giants, in the video, you have um, an incredible scene of the loggerhead <laughs> turtle that you rescued. And I know that that video pretty much went viral. So can you tell us a little bit more about that story and sort of the impact it's had for your work? Absolutely. So what's wonderful about that particular story is we were out at Lighthouse Reef Atoll and we are looking to better understand what's going on with male turtles, both hawksbills and loggerheads. There are three turtle species that we tend to see most frequently in Belize. So they're greens, hawksbills and loggerheads. So we're out at Lighthouse Reef and we want to understand how they're utilizing the sea in the marine protected areas in Belize and why male turtles because as um, our seas are warming, as, we're, as temperatures are rising, male turtles are going to become much more, uh, much more threatened by these rising temperatures because when eggs are laid in the sand, unfortunately, they're temperature dependent. The sex is temperature dependent. So the higher the temperature, the more likelihood you're going to have females. So we need to know a little bit more about what's happening to males. They tend to get poached a lot more in part for uh, body parts, like their hemipenes, turtle penises, and so much more. Um, so here we are at Lighthouse, wanting to find out how these turtles are moving about and how do we go about doing that? Well, we have to actually catch the animals. And we had been going all day looking for turtles and they have to come, they're obligate air breathers, so they come to the surface and breathe. We were not finding any when, Finally, I'm at the bow of our boat, Talasa, and I'm like, wait, there, that's a loggerhead, it's huge. And Ivan, one of our fabulous Fisher colleagues, he was he's actually in, in, he's in the video, he's like, oh, I said, Ivan, what do you think? Do you think we can get it? And I'm pointing to where it is. And he says, as he straps on his mask and pulls on his fins, he jumps into the water and literally single-handedly sneaks up behind the turtle. It, the turtle was having sexy time with another turtle. And so Ivan interrupted turtle sexy time 
managed to catch the turtle and brought him back to the boat, at which point many people helped get that turtle on the boat so we could get it satellite tagged and then later released, as you see in the video. And it really is, everybody thinks that it's a CGI turtle, but it's not. That yeah. is truly the size. We think that that animal is over 70 years old. And in fact, when it was born and a youngster, Winston Churchill was hmm. still wandering the halls, I guess, of Westminster. Wow, incredible. Um, I think that's the first time that Turtle Sexy Time has made it onto the expo stage. So <laughs> now we're very tight on time. So just to ask one more question, because you didn't mention these the, the monitoring work you're doing and these satellite tags. Um, are, are those expensive? How much do those cost? And tell us a little bit briefly about your current needs. Yeah, so, I mean, just to give you an idea, one of the satellite tags plus all of the time integrated for a whole year for one turtle is close to $5,000 US. That's just to give you an idea, but it's going to give us information day in, day out, bad weather or not. And then our monitoring itself, where we're really looking at the abundances, not only of turtles, but sharks and fin fish and more. And these are providing conservation jobs for the fishers is close to $50,000 per large site per year. And we are working multiple sites mm -hmm. in different countries. Fantastic. Well, we hope you are able to raise that and WCN is here to uh, help facilitate those donations. Uh, Jamal, Rachel, unfortunately, that's all we have for time. So thank you very much. But um, everyone watching, if your question wasn't answered or if you have additional questions, please direct yourself to the Mar Alliance booth, which you can find on the left side of your stage, and they will be in their booth to answer more questions. Rachel, Jamal, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you as well. Thank you very much. All right. So from the blue waters of Central America, we now head to an inland lake in Central Africa. And here we're gonna be learning about a little known animal that lives in the murky freshwater that's in real trouble. So now I'll hand it over to my friend, Aristide Takukam Kamla, who will, help, <coughs> excuse me, who will tell us more about his work. Hello, welcome to Lake Osa a lake that is very special to me because here you will find the African manatee, one of my favorite wildlife species. I'm Dr. Aristita Kukam Kamla. My first time, the first time I came here was in 2008. I was doing my master degree in wildlife ecology. So when I came here, I was coming to count the number of manatee that are present here. I was expecting to see manatee as easy as we see them in Crystal River. I didn't realize how much the species is elusive and cryptic. I spent two good months looking for the animal and I couldn't see any. Until I talked to a fisherman who took me with his canoe and we move around, we navigated around the lake and he showed me my first manatee. It was a very emotive moment when I saw this manatee calf surfacing and taking, taking some air. I was also in the same time shocked that I have been there for a long time without talking to the people who could have helped me. I was thinking myself as a big scientist who doesn't need a local local people. But since then I realized that if we want to better study the African manatee, we need to do it with the fishermen because they have the knowledge. It's their daily activity. They go to the water all the time for to fish or to go to, to the farm. So they have more chance to encounter the animal than me, the researcher, who is most of the time at the office and will cannot come very often because of financial limitation. So since then I decided to include fishermen in my, res in my research approach. So I built this mobile app called Siren in 2015. And through this app, fishermen are able to report opportunistic sightings, not only of the African manatee, but of other aquatic wildlife like dolphins, whales, sharks, rays, sea turtles, and you can name it. 
Today, we have more than 15,000 observations that has been documented by those fishermen. And through those information, we were able to advocate for the legal protection of five species of marine mammals, including the highly threatened Atlantic humpback dolphin. Lake Osa is a unique habitat for the African manatee. It's known in the literature as a refuge for the species. When I came here in 2008, it was very common to see manatee meat in restaurants. People were killing manatee without fearing anything. And I was sad to see that. So this is where I founded the organization, the African Marine Mammal Conservation Organization. And I trained our young scientists like me who are now working for the organization. So with my team, we put in place conservation strategies, including sensitization, the native livelihood, uh, also doing surveillance with the conservation service. Through those actions, in 10 years, we, the impact was visible. Now, there's no single restaurant serving manatee food. And it's been almost two years now that I have not heard that a manatee has been killed in Lake Osa. But as we were about to celebrate this success, look what happened. An invasive plant species called the Salvinia molester. This plant started spreading in Lake Osa in 2016 as a result of a nutrient enrichment coming from the adjacent Sanaga River. The situation is very similar to what is happening now in Florida with the nutrient pollution in the Indian River Lagoon, nitrogens building up, uh, coming from, from septics and making, providing nutrient for the blooming of algae. And this, those algae, as they're blooming, they prevent the preventing light from penetrating the water column and thereby killing seagrasses. And last year, because of the lack of seagrasses, more than 1,100 manatee died from starving as they couldn't get food. The situation is less dramatic here in Cameroon, although it's problematic. As the lake become enriched in nitrogen, this plant called Savinia starts proliferating, and today it covers over 40% of the lake surface. Before this plant, it was easy to see manatee, but today it's almost impossible to see the animals. But we are not seeing carcass, which is a hope that they, are not, they did not die. They probably move into a different ecosystem. The Salvinia prevents manatee from surfacing and breathe, and is also competing with their favorite plant species, Echinocloa pyramidalis. Salvinia is now because it has become the dominant plant species of the lake. We have the solution against Salvinia. First, we put in place a biological control approach where we're using weaver uh, that fits specifically on the on the Salvinia and on nothing else. No worries, it's not. Uh, gonna, it doesn't impact any other plants or lives. With the support of the Louisiana State University, we were able to acquire a batch of weaver that has reared, and now uh, we are piloting the use of those weaver in a small corner of Lake Osa. But parallel to that, we are applying another solution, the ecological charcoal using Salvinia. I will pass it on to my colleague, uh, Zanga Anik, she will explain you how it works. Salut, moi c'est Anik Zangada. Je suis chargée du développement communautaire à Amco, plus précisément dans la production du charbon écologique avec les communautés riveraines du lac Osa. Nous organisons des campagnes de retrait de la Salvinia molesta avec les, les communautés de pêcheurs et des volontaires eh, qui sont aussi affectés par eh, cette plante-là. Et ensuite, Nous transformons donc euh, la biomasse issue de ce retrait euh, 
en charbon écologique, en utilisant des procédés très simples, nous faisons sécher la salvinia. Après avoir séché cette salvinia, nous la faisons brûler à l'aide de fûts de carbonisation. Et à la fin, nous obtenons une poudre de charbon que nous faisons, que nous mélangeons avec des liens, ça peut être de l'amidon ou de l'argile, et, et nous utilisons... Euh, nous utilisons une machine manuelle pour compacter euh, des, des briquettes de charbon. À bas. Et ensuite, nous faisons sécher ces briquettes de charbon. Bon, euh, cette activité est bénéfique non seulement pour le lac qui, retrouve, qui, qui peut retrouver sa santé écologique et nous la combinons à la lutte biologique que nous faisons à l'aide du charançon de Salvinia. Et aussi, l'activité euh, va favoriser le... le, le les activités des pêcheurs, parce que euh, nous faisons, quand nous faisons le retrait de la plante, nous dégageons les, les, les canaux de navigation. Et à la fin, euh, cette activité aussi permettra d'apporter du revenu. Est, elle, elle, elle est comme activité génératrice de revenus pour ceux qui la pratiquent, dont ils peuvent vendre ce charbon ou encore même l'utiliser à domicile. Espérons vous revoir ici au lac pour ça. Je vous dis bye bye. Thank you, Annick. So we hope that very in the next five years, we will get rid of Salvinia using these two approach. Now, let me talk about another actions that we are putting in place here to protect the African manatee, environmental education. We work with students around the village to educate them on the importance of protecting the African manatee, but also the importance of the Lake Osa. I'll pass it on to my other uh, colleague, uh, Clementine Menger, who will explain how uh, the, she worked with the students to, pro to promote manatee conservation. Bonsoir, je suis Clementine Menger, ingénieure en gestion des pêches et des écosystèmes aquatiques. Je travaille avec AMCO en tant que chargée du développement communautaire. L'éveil de conscience passe par euh, les cours d'éducation environnementale que nous dispensons dans les, les, les établissements scolaires et les sensibilisations environnementales que nous faisons avec les pêcheurs au quotidien. Alors, pour faire cela, nous donnons des cours dans des établissements scolaires de la CIL en terminale. Et nous organisons avec les élèves des sorties extrascolaires dans le lac Ossa pour leur permettre de toucher du doigt les réalités que nous leur enseignons au courant de l'année scolaire. S'agissant des sensibilisations, la pêche illicite dans le lac Ossa se fait de plus en plus ressentie et cela mène souvent à des captures accidentelles de la, du lamentin d'Afrique. Pour éviter cela, nous organisons des causeries et des focus groups avec des, des pêcheurs régulièrement pour leur détailler sur euh, les conséquences justement d'une pêche irresponsable. One day, as I was doing some data collection on the lake here, a fisherman came to me and said, Aristide, why are you guys spending that much money to protect the African manatee? And now there are numerous in the lake, there's so plenty in the lake and they are destroying our net. It seems as if manatee is more important than human being. Why are you not investing also on us? And I reflect on what the fisherman said and he was right. We were so focused on the manatee without thinking of the people who live around the manatee and the people who can have an impact on the species. From then, we from there we decided to include fishermen into our conservation approach, a community-based conservation where fishermen have their work to say. So every year we organize a meeting with the fishermen where they share with us their priority, priority the thing that they would like us to do, to, do, to help them with. And we've been working only with men, but also with women to put in place alternative livelihood activities that have been decided by the local community. Again, I will pass it on to Clementine, who will explain how she's working with the local community to do this, uh, uh, this alternative livelihood. De notre côté, nous avons les activités génératrices de revenus que nous proposons aux communautés pour pouvoir euh, les aider à générer des revenus, étant donné que la pêche n'est plus très rentable depuis l'invasion du lac par la Chalvinia. Parmi ces activités-là, nous avons déjà eu à proposer aux communautés l'élevage des escargots, la culture des champignons, l'élevage des abeilles pour la production du miel, la fabrication du savon, du vinaigre bah, pour les femmes, la mise en place même d'un fonds rotatif pour accompagner les femmes de la communauté. 
Merci pour votre attention. Nous espérons vous voir au lac au sein du C4 pour visiter et découvrir ce merveilleux espace dans lequel nous travaillons. Bye bye. So through this, all these activities, we have been able to achieve an important impact. Going from killing manatee and selling it to restaurant, today in Lake Osa, this doesn't exist anymore through the collaborative action of AMCO team and the conservation service and other partners. And we would like to replicate this into a different other areas where manatee are highly hunted. The Cam River. And yesterday, I received an information that five manatees was killed in that area. And it's important that the approach that we have applied here, we replicate it in that area also, enabled in order to educate by educating the community not to killing the manatee, by providing them alternative livelihood, and also by supporting the conservation service there to patrol in order to dissuade people that are determined to kill the African manatee. The tax is huge, but by working hand in hand with you, with other people who want to join this effort, we can have a big impact. Aristide, thank you so much for sharing your work and thank you for joining us here at the WCN Expo. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share about the work that my team and I are doing in Cameroon to protect the African manatee. So Aristide, tell us, how did you get into this line of work? What is your, your beginnings here? So everything started when I, I went to the to Lake Osa to do my master research, and uh, I, I wanted to know, you know, to start, to know how many manatee were in the lake. Uh, but I was surprised to realize that it was difficult to see the manatee, but also that they were highly uh, hunted, and there was no organization working to protect the species. So this is when I decided to initiate the uh, first non-profit organization, local organization in Cameroon, dedicated for the protection of the species. And I've trained uh, young uh, uh, students that are now working for me, that are working for the organization for the past uh, six years. Great, so I think a lot of folks in the audience are just discovering African manatees for the first time, but a lot of people are more familiar with the manatee that we have sort of here in the United States, for example, that's an ocean dwelling animal. Um, Deborah, for example, in the audience asks uh, if the manatees in around Lake Osa, if they have access to the oceans. Yes, the African manatee do have access to the ocean. Uh, I mean, most of them have access to the, uh, to the ocean, even though there are some isolated population. However, they spend less time in the ocean because our ocean here is, uh, tends to be, uh, also be murky, so there's no sea grasses. So uh, African manatee tend to depend more on emerge, on the emergent vegetation, this uh, grass that grows uh, along the shoreline of rivers and lake. And you know that manatee eat, uh, spend most of their time eating and resting. So they eat like 10% of their body mass every day. So they will spend their time where there is more food and this place will be the fresh water, although they can also use uh, the marine water. So Linda has a question about the salvinia, that's the invasive plant that's suffocating Lake Osa. She wants to know how did that plant get to Lake Osa? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, we don't exactly know how this plant uh, get into Lake Osa. However, uh, the, my PhD uh, research, which was actually supported by WCN, uh, reveals that there was a drastic increase of nitrogen and phosphorus nutrient uh, in the between 2016 and 2017, which is likely caused by the construction of a reservoir dam up Sanaga, uh, upstream Sanaga River, which is connected to the lake. So this change of nutrient concentration into the lake had uh, make it favorable for Salvinia to proliferate at the detriment of other 
uh, uh, native plant species like Echinocloa, the manatee uh, favorite uh, plant species in the lake. And so you're using this insect, the weevil, to help control the salvinia. Is that is it working? How's it going right now? So uh, I mean that initially it was it was uh, very tough uh, to uh, have this working because it was the first time that we were using this method in Cameroon to combat uh, uh, salvinia, and we were also facing a difficulty link uh, due to the. Uh, wind and current that was changing where Salvinia was uh, was going, so it was difficult to monitor our impact. But we recently found out that in one side where we released the weevil, uh, the Salvinia is completely gone there, and uh, we are planning to use that spot to collect the salvin infested Salvinia with the weevil and disseminate it throughout the lake with the hope that in the next two or three years, we will be able to get rid of the Salvinia using uh, the biological control method, combined also to the mechanical uh, manual removal method as Anik uh, showed you how we removing the Salvinia with the community and transforming, transforming it into bio, uh, biological charcoal, ecological charcoal. Mm, wow. So we know that you have this incredible program. It's doing good work and you're trying to grow your organization. What are some of your, your highest priority needs right now? How can people help? So in Lake Osa, our priority need is mostly the, the community. The community is highly impacted. Uh, as you heard in the video, uh, uh, manatee poaching in Lake Osa has almost stopped. And we are worried that if we don't do something for the community who is impacted by the Salvinia also, they may, they may go back into and start hunting manatee again. So we put in, uh, we would like to uh, uh, amplify or scale up the transformation of the Salvinia into biological charcoal. And for that, we need about 15,000 this year so that we will buy those machines that you saw they're using to press to try to make the bricks of charcoal. And the other priority will be also to disseminate, disseminate the weevil throughout the lake. And for that, we need work for the gas and, uh, the, and oil and everything. And we estimate that it will cost us about $25,000 this year. Okay, great. Well, hopefully some folks in the audience have also been inspired to make a donation, which you can do to WCN, and we will make sure that all those donations go directly to Aristide and his team at AMCO. Aristide, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, too. Bye-bye. All right. So now from Central Africa, we sail over to East Africa for a session with an incredible group called Sea Sense that is working with local communities to protect turtles and other marine animals. Sea Sense organization has been doing marine conservation work for 21 years in Tanzania mainland with a total of 35 conservation officers positioned in the coastal regions, marine conservation awareness has penetrated among the coastal community members. Conservation officers are residents of the coastal villages elected by their communities to work with citizens. Each day, they conduct foot patrols on turtle nesting beaches in their areas to monitor nesting activity and protect nests from predators and poachers. Nests at risk are relocated to small hatcheries on the same beach using internationally approved protocols. Conservation officers also conduct awareness raising activities in their communities to encourage cooperation and support for endangered marine wildlife conservation. Efforts of citizens conservation officers has been obstructed by several number of challenges, including artificial lighting on sea turtle nesting beaches, dynamite fishing, sea turtle eggs and meat poaching, as well as natural predation of sea turtle nests. <laughs> Kuna utaratibu sasa hivi umebadilika watu wanakesha fukweni kwa ajili ya kuspe ya kufanya starehe zao. Kwa hiyo hata upandaji wa kasa unakuwa ni wa mashaka kwa sababu muda wote ta utazikuta zinapiga mpaka baharini. Hiyo ni changamoto ya kwanza. Lakini ya pili pia sasa hivi utaratibu ambao tulikuwa tumeuzwa hapa katikati umeshaanza kutoweka. Bomu wameshaanza watu kupiga. Mabomu yanaasili kwa kila kitu. 
kwa kila mazalio ya samaki ukiwa kasa hata kwa viumbe vingine ambao vinavyoishi baharini kwa sababu bomu likilia kila alicho aliyomo baharini anajua kabisa kwamba ile ni hatari kwake kwa hiyo vitu vyote tunakuwa tunaharibikiwa kutokana na hali ya bomu uvuvi ni hatari sana kwa sababu unaanza tena kuturudisha kwenye kuvunja matumbawe ambayo ni mazalio ya samaki na sasa hivi tulikuwa tumeshaanza kuwapata samaki kiulaisi ufukweni badala ya kwenda mpaka maji mengi sasa wakianza kupiga teni na maana kwamba samaki watazidi na kufanyaje watimika mapaya ni kisiwa ambacho kinapatikana kwa ya mfuraka kama ni kisiwa ambacho kinakaa wakazi wengi tofauti 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 kwa kila sehemu na wanaenda kufanya uvuvi watu kasa wanajua kama chakula cha kawaida wavuvi na kwenda kula na vua wanyo na wana waua na wanakenda kuuza kwa mapaya ndio basema madalio ya kasi kasa ile bali kupanda juu usiku watu huwa namna kila kitu kule wanaliwa kwanza watu kwanza mwenyewe mpaka mpaka mayai yake watoto hawafiki kwa kwani wafiki kuzaliwa watoto sababu kule wana mayai wana chipona na kula na yala sababu gani hawajua hawajua faida yake nini sababu hana simini haja hana elimu yote ya kasi mapaya kule zokumba kule ulinzi usimkishwe bibi yao na ndio maana kule watu wanakula kasa kama kawaida ile mungu na ulinzi usimkishwe ngulo wangu kwa na wanawekemea ule wale wavuvi ambao wanakula kwa kasi na tofauti na pamoja na mbona ulinzi wa sikisho huko na na sense hapa huko na kufanya kazi huko nitapendekeza alifanya ngao simina ya kisiwa hicho mapana kwenda ngao kwa siku moja na kutoaibi sababu hii kazi tunafanya pamoja na huko kushirikiana serikali pamoja na nchi kwa simina na kwa kukumbusha mtoka mimi nimeanza kufanya kazi nilianza kwa changamoto kubwa watu wakawa hawajanielewa vizuri walikuwa wanakula kasa lakini najitahidi kuwaelimisha yani sasa ikaenda wakiwa wakichinja kasa wanamtoa wanampima nawaambia mfukieni nasimamia wanamfukia nikitoka wanamfua <laughs> wanakula au wanauza baadaye ikaenda nikagundua yani kuna wavuvi mwingine anakuambia ah afsa yani mama kasa ni kuambia leo kasa kauzwa sehemu gani au wao wanunua kasa ananipigia simu asubuhi nikija nawaambia kiupole jamani nimeshawaambia ni moja mbili tatu aisteli kula kasa kwa sababu ni hatari mnaweza mkapata shida um, mkapelekwa jela mkaacha familia zenu mkashindwa pia hata kufanya kazi zenu kwa wakati kwa sababu mnapovua kwa uharali sio kila wakati mletee maskari na nini inatakiwa muache hivyo vitu kweli mabadiliko hayo ni makubwa sana cha kwa kweli ulaji wa kasa kwa sasa hivi umepungua Shirikiano wetu nayo mama tuko karibu unaona bana lolote lile ndoko kutuambia sisi tunamuelewa kwa bana kitu jamaa msikifanye kitu fulani unaona bana na mkifanya hicho kitu madhara yake kitu fulani kwa hiyo paka sasa hivi kasa bana hapa haliwi unaona bana haliwi hata kwa fimbo haliwi na kasa hao anataga mayai mama atashirikiana naye usiku asubuhi tunatoa mayai pale alipotaga yule kasa unafanyaje tunakuja kuweka pale kwenye kiota pale mpaka ikifika muda wake mayai yanatotoka hayo wanaendelea na maisha yao vifaranga baharini changamoto nilizokabiliana nazo katika kazi yangu kuna wadudu wanaitwa fakule ambao kama si wapo kama si yafu au kama chungu yani nyenyele kwa hiyo pale wanaingia mule ndani wanapita chini kwa chini yani kutoboa mayai kuyaharibu kwa hiyo hata mfano mayai yote wanaweza kukaribu alafu vile vile kuna wadudu fulani wanaitwa nyegele vile vile wanao tuangaisha wanachana zile sehemu kwenye nyavu wanapindukia kwa hiyo wanachipa wanachipa mayai wanaharibu wanakula vile vile kenge au ndo wanao katika changamoto yangu ndo ninaoona katika shughuli zangu wakule wanakuja kwa sababu mule yale mayai kushikwa fikia na asia yanaruku kama kama shombo fulani au wakisha kupita mule ndani na wakija kuyakuta mayai yale wanavuta harufu wakisha kupika pale ndo wanaharibu mayai kisha kupika katika mayai wanazunguruka mayai kisha wanayatoboa yani kuyatoboa toboa au kupata yale maji ya ndani yale yote yale kunyonya kuyatoboa yani kuyaharibu kwa hiyo akitoka pale ndo anaongezeka yake yatoboa kuna uchafu fulani ukitoka ndo kwa kule wanazidi kuja yani mayai kisha kutobolewa tena hapo tena hayatoki tena inakuwa ndo ameshaharibika tena haya haya faya kwa kule watoto wanaharibu wanawaganda katika macho kila kila sehemu yani wanawatafuta tafuna wanawabandia watoto kwa kwenye mdomo mpaka kufika kwenye pua kupaka kucha kutoa tunzi yani kwa maumivu ya wapakuke kwa watoto tena hawana kumelipo wala kwa 
Kwanza mwaka huu karibu mbili na shina mbili. Nipata kiota kumi na moja. Kwa kila kiota kimoja kikuwa kama la mayai mia mbina moja na kuendele. Kiota kumi na moja, kiota saba vipalipiwa yote na fako. Kwa hiyo wapu kama mkono toka, kama mbili na geji yangu marumu kwe. Mirongi mbele. Kwa hiyo kama mwata wenda fako kwe. Wanakuwa, wanakuwa wengi sasa. Kwa hivi, nalasimika, na wakasa atipu tanga, na yate mayai pali pali. Sabo kama watachukua mayai kwa mbila kate na kule, tukua kuka fako. Kwa hiyo mtu nazi pali pali. Kapa sembaya na patu nachukua mahali nuweka sehemu, wakini na patu kakunye, siyo salama. Siyo salama kwa sababu, waneza hapa mtu wakawa na mikuona na jificha badai, kuja kuwa chukua. Lakini kama mpano patakuwa na gie jipale, kinoku pana kuwa pana stangi. Wakini kama patu nachivivi, pana kuja watu kuchukua. Hau kama asio watu, basi kengi ya nazi akapita, asaifai ya pana ulindi wa kwa lebanda, basi kengi ya kija na kukua. Kwa mishe banda, Mweka sehemu nyingine. Mweka sehemu nyingine sio simu hizo kwa sababu kwamba mkuu atakupa wapi? Yaani tukichukua banda tukiweka sehemu nyingine. Usikuweka baada ya miaka kadhaa basi pakule huenda kaudi kutokana na nini? Kutokana na wale pakule kuna wale mayai kuna kisha kuatoa kuna uteute kwani una unabaki. Kisha kubakia pakule kama ataka matakuwa mbali kidogo wanakuja pale wanakaa pale kujenga kuharibu kukaa. Yapo kama utakuja tena kuweka mayai kutoka pale usio kwa siku nyingi basi pakuwe uenda waka tokea tena. Ilapendekeza mimi, utafiki mfanyike. Tupata kama vile madawa, kama mitijamba, kama madawa. Ilibani kusha kupata madawa, tuangalie, tuafanyaje, tunatengeneza katika madawa, tunamogia mwumia mule, ili mnadi pakule, wasili. Kwa toto wa toki hote, salama, wende bahalini kwa salama kwa hote. Ili tunaendeleza kitati jingide cha kasa kama watakuja. Kwa sababu kasa wako wachache, wa toki hote, wende bahalini kwa salama, ili mbali wa wengi zaidi, ili mbali wa kubuzetu ya mazetu wa watakaifuja nao wa wanaifaji na kumbiwa kasa. Despite of the challenges, CSENS works hand in hand with the conservation officers and groups of coastal community members, such as children, women, fishers, and beach management units to solve the existing marine conservation challenges in Tanzania by providing awareness through various training, school campaigns, and theater for development. It is our responsibility together to protect the marine wildlife and its environment. All right, thank you so much. Now I welcome Navo Omari Kaniki to the screen. Uh, Navo, welcome to WCN Expo. It's so nice to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us. And we're happy to be here on behalf of CSENS. Great. So, so I'd love to learn more about your work. Uh, but before we get to CSENS, I want to hear more about you. What, what inspired you to get into this type of conservation work? Uh, so my, um, my previous work was mostly helping clients to prepare environmental management plans and, and documents for the various projects and I, I, I was really intrigued to understand on the ground and at community level how that would translate um, our thoughts and our plans um, that we prepare for different projects whether it's infrastructure or development projects but how is it actually received at a community level and how does that actually affect um, the sensitive resources at that community level. So I live in Dar es Salaam and my kids are always fascinated about the ocean. So when an opportunity arose for me to be part of ocean conservation, marine resource conservation, yeah, I was pleased to be part of that. Mm, fantastic. Um, tell us a little bit about the the turtles that you're encountering. What type of what type of species are they? And uh, yeah, any other kind of marine wildlife that you encounter? So uh, along the mainland of Tanzania, the um, the most popular species is green turtle. We do have some locations um, where we get reports of um, hawksbill. Um, very rare do we get leatherback and the other species that are found along the wire region. Um, 
So primarily along our coasts and in our database is the green turtle. Mm. Now in your, do, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, we do um, engage community members and fishers to identify locations where they have seen dugongs. It's not very common, um, as many of you know, that dugongs in the Y region are, are critically endangered. So um, there are very few um, incidences where fishers do report that they have seen them, but we haven't been able to um, do a special tracking or um, a survey to identify and confirm the current habitat and foraging grounds. Now the work you do is it's it's so impressive in the ways you engage local fishers and local community members. Um, what would it mean to them if sea turtles and the dugongs were no longer in the the marine environment? So that's a good question because that's something that we are constantly trying to. Um, how do you say? Um, give awareness to them on the importance of those species and their connection to their livelihoods. Um, it's easy for us to understand them as key indicator species, but for a fisher in a small coastal community, it's not so easy to piece it together. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, they understand that it is part of the marine resource, and most of them will refer it as a free gift um, from God for them to be able to sustain their livelihood. Although sometimes that can come with a negative perception that they can then poach them in times of need for food and their eggs for food. So it's trying to link and give them more awareness and understanding that actually when you see a turtle, that's a good indicator of a healthy ecosystem and a healthy ecosystem means that there are grounds for you to fish um, and healthier grounds for, for the fish, pop, fish population to, to be sustained. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's a little bit, um, it's a continuous process where we, that's why we continuously have um, conservation officers who are members of the community and we also try and do additional outreach and awareness um, to the coastal communities as much as we can along the Tanzanian mainland. Yeah, so, you know, in, in the presentation, we saw people like Miss Anna, who's really building a lot of trust and, and deep relationships with community members. Um, that must be such a hard process. How do you go about building that trust and getting people to change their mindsets? So our approach primarily um, stands that you have to understand their way of life and their way of living, where they live, and what challenges they face, because oftentimes it's easy for one to, to judge when you hear of poaching, but it's, it's complicated um, and it's not always intention. Um, so they need to be, um, we find that as our conservation officers are part of the community, it's people who can speak the language, um, understand the jokes, um, you know, understand little cultural references or the history of, you know, the fishers, because you'll find, you know, parents will take the children and they would see the children grow. So being able to talk to them continuously um, and, and the trust is built over years of relationship. So the key is really building a relationship with the, with the fishers. It's not coming with a top-down approach. It's coming with, okay, where, what are you doing? how are you doing it is that practice harmful or sustainable and then trying to explain to them slowly in a way that they can gradually understand showing them examples um showing them you know pictorial references even at times trying to um give them opportunities to do exchange visits to neighboring villages who maybe have caught on a little bit faster and things like that. So it's really about building relationships 
with the fishers, mm. um, understanding the way of life, understanding the culture, understanding the challenges, and getting them to see you as someone who um, actually wants to contribute to sustaining the livelihood and not coming as a top-down enforcer with this with a stick, you know. So yeah, yeah that's powerful, and that's a a way to make sure that that conservation practices are lasting for the long term. Um, I have so many more questions for you, but unfortunately time is tight. So I'll just ask you one more question. Um, your organization does fantastic work and uh, what are some of your funding needs at the moment? Kind of some of your top priorities that maybe someone in the audience might be able to help with. Well, thank you very much. So um, as you know, CSENS, we're currently covering six districts in Tanzania. However, we get um, we get community members and and interested stakeholders who inform us of more locations where turtle nesting and poaching occur. So it's really to try and expand our conservation network to some more of the coastal um, districts of the mainland, and also to to try and understand um, the challenges in relation to marine litter and climate change in those nesting beaches. So to be able to have, for example, a, a research study on climate change and changing, for example, changing um, temperatures in sand and how that might affect um, turtle nestings, turtle nests, and that would be interesting. And, and also just more work in terms of methods where communities can manage marine litter in an effective way to protect the nesting grounds and also for their public health and safety. So those are kind of the, the areas where we would be hoping to um, to get support in and to continue our work in. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. If folks have additional questions for Navo, please join her in the C-Sense booth following this session. Um, Navo, good luck with all of your work, and I'm so appreciative for all that you're doing for our aquatic wildlife. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for having us, and yeah, we look forward to more um, collaboration with WCN, and happy 20th anniversary for WCN as well. Thank you so much. All right, well, this officially wraps our online wildlife conservation expo for 2022. Thank you so much for joining us today for Life Aquatic and all week long. I hope you're feeling more connected, more inspired to help uh, wildlife and the conservationists at the front line who have dedicated their lives to protecting wildlife, wild lands, and helping local people thrive. So for more sessions like today, please check out our YouTube channel. And if you like what you've, saw, what you've seen today, please consider making a donation to WCN at wildnet.org. And we'll make sure that your donations are put to the best use for wildlife. And then lastly, we hope to see you at the next WCN Expo. So thank you very much and good night.